Good morning. Uh, if you would, go ahead and turn to John chapter 6. Uh, last week, we wrapped up John chapter 5. We were in there for quite a few Sundays. John chapter 5, of course, was uh, the healing of the lame man who had been healed for 38 years. Uh, Jesus intentionally and deliberately went to him, healed him, told him to pick up his mat, uh, to, to, stick, to get up, pick up his mat, and walk. He walked to the temple. The Pharisees saw him walking to the temple. And thus they uh, called him out and called Jesus out for healing him on the Sabbath. And so chapter 5 is one of the longest teachings against the Pharisees that, that John has. It will come up cyclically as we go through the book of John, but it's one of the longest. And John chapter 5 is also one of the deepest as far as describing and identifying the true identity of Jesus. As yes, he is the Son of God, he is also the Son of Man. And there last week as we closed chapter 5, we saw we're almost like a, a, a judge in a jury type setting where the Pharisees are, are putting themselves in the seat of Moses and they are judging Jesus, who is also God, but they are judging him and Jesus calls his witnesses to the stand and they're actually judging the Pharisees. So he calls John the Baptist, right? That was the great herald that God sent. They knew was coming. They had prophesied that, that this great prophet was coming to announce the Messiah. So he calls John the Baptist to give witness to him. He calls the signs, the wonders, to give witness, to bear witness that he is who he claims to be. He calls God the Father, and he calls the Pharisees against themselves. He says, you are doing these things for your own glory, for the praise of man, not for the praise of God. And then finally, at the end of chapter 5, uh, Jesus calls Moses himself. And this is huge because they are claiming to be the disciples of Moses. And so Jesus actually calls Moses to his side to speak against those Pharisees. So that takes us right to where we are now at closing chapter 5 and opening chapter 6 today. So look at uh, John 6. We're going to go 1 through 15. It is a very long chapter. There's a lot, it's hard to even find exactly where to stop when we're just taking certain portions on Sundays. Uh, but we're going to do 1 through 15 today. After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias, and a large crowd was following him. Because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick, Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. Lifting up his eyes then, and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? He said this to test them, to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred denarii would, worth of bread would not be enough for each person, for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they, uh, what are they with so many? Jesus said, Have the people sit down. Now there was, a much, there was much grass in that place. So the men sat down, about 5,000 in number. Jesus then took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish, as much as they wanted. And when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, Gather up the leftover fragments, that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and filled twelve baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, This is indeed the prophet who is come into the world. Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we acknowledge you as God, God Almighty, creator of all things. We thank you, Lord, for making us. We thank you, Lord, that even though we have sinned, you have sent the Savior, Jesus the Christ, the Son of God, the Son of Man, incarnate to take away our sins, who lived, who died, who ascended into heaven, and will, is reigning supreme and will judge all mankind. We thank you that the peace that we have to, to gather here today, knowing that we, are, we have been made right in your eyes by this perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ. We thank you for that, God. Enrich us today as we dwell on your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, now between chapter 5 and chapter 6, uh, the book of John, there is a difference. Some say around six months, some say up to a year. 
But there is a quite a distinct difference here. Uh, chapter 5, if you kind of let them build, you see slowly that the popularity of Jesus has been building. But then all of a sudden we get to chapter 6, and there are thousands upon thousands upon thousands, and we'll get to this in a moment, that are following Jesus. So John does not go into great detail about what went on between chapter 5 and chapter 6 over this time period. It is, however, covered in the synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They expound upon that, expand that, and let us know what happened in that time period. So, that G so John doesn't record all miracles, but he does record quite several here. But he records, he skips from chapter 5, the healing of the lame man, the confrontation with the Pharisees, straight over to the feeding of the thousands of people. Now the synoptics, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Matthew, Mark, and Luke let us know that in between this time is when John the Baptist was arrested. It is when John the Baptist was actually killed by having his head chopped off. And then we have, uh, we have many miracles that Matthew, Mark, and Luke record that happened during this time. So he was uh, causing the, the blind to see, the deaf ears to hear. Uh, he was uh, casting out demons, et cetera, et cetera, that there's so many they're not recorded there for us, even in those, but they are quite, a more, quite more listed. So we see the popularity has grown. Now, most likely, uh, John was aware. There was a, a, a different theories. It could be all the other Gospels had already been written, most likely, but the, this information was out there so that John did not feel the need to record every miracle that Jesus did. But not even the other synoptic Gospels claim to have recorded every miracle that Jesus did, right? Uh, but John has a purpose, and we'll keep coming back to this purpose. He's listed the purpose for us, John chapter 20, verse 30 through 31. And we see that he is maintaining his purpose. He's not trying to exhaustively record every single supernatural sign that Jesus performed. Signs are very important, as we've covered and will cover even today in the coming weeks. Uh, they are God's way of validating and authentic authenticating God's messenger, especially new revelation, like the time when Moses came. Moses was authenticated by God, right? So Jesus, last week in chapter 5, says, look at my signs. These things are obviously supernatural, all right? They are done by God. So they're important. They, we need to see them, but John does not think we need every one of them. Uh, he makes this uh, uh, point in verse 30, John chapter 20. He says, now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. And between chapter 5 and chapter 6, this is where so many of those would be. But these are written, and then you have this great purpose statement of John, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So John does not record every miracle, but intentionally chose specific ones that proved that Jesus is the Christ, the prophesied Messiah, that he is the Son of God. And what are we to do with that? We are to believe in him, that we may have life in his name. So that's kind of where we're at today. A lot of things, John skips over a lot. A lot of that information is covered in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Other miracles and supernatural signs have been accomplished, but John has recorded these. Just, uh, just I believe it's, it's depending on how you count, that seven miracles, uh, signs that are really clear in the book of John, distinct ones. And yet here we have one of the most popular miracles recorded because it's covered in all four of the Gospels. In fact, if you, it's one of the most commonly known ones as well, Jesus feeding of the thousands, right? Uh, with the barley and the fish that comes to mind quite easily. One of the reasons it is covered in every one of the Gospels. And John, though, kind of uses it for maybe a different reason than the others because he records all this great teaching that we're not going to get to fully today, but he uses it. it the, he sees the sign, uh, records the sign, records the miracle, then he gets to all the great teaching that follows where Jesus ties this teaching back in to the sign. All right? Now, let's look at verse 1. Uh, after this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias, and a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. Now here, 
John alludes to the spiritual nature of the people who are following him. It does not say that they're following him because they love him. It does not say they follow him because they want to listen to him, that they want to learn, that they want to hear from him. Uh, why are they following him? The answer is very clear, right? Uh, verse 2, because they saw the signs that he was doing on the, the sick. This is why they were following him. Not because they had seen John announce, this is the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sin of the world. Hi, I'm a sinner. I need my, my sin taken away. They did not come to Jesus for repentance. John is hinting at they've come because they want to see the signs. And we have to remind ourselves again and again as you go through a gospel of signs, miracles, wonders are just not the norm. Uh, these people had never seen anything like this before. Not only that generation, but going back many, 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 many generations of Israel, they had never seen anything like this. There's really nothing like this. You do have, as we've mentioned, you have Elijah that performed seven uh, signs. You have Elisha who performed 14. You go back to Moses, who's the most, who, who performed the most supernatural signs and miracles of anyone in the the entire Bible and the history of man except for Jesus. Uh, but besides that, they, there's nothing there as far as these signs that are being accomplished. So these people are seeing the signs. They want to see more signs. There's people who are being healed of blindness, healed of deafness. There are demons that are coming out of people. They want more of this, and they're following Jesus now by the thousands. All right? Look at verse 3. Jesus went up on the mountain and there he sat down with his disciples. Uh, not, not a lot to be said here, but we do see multiple times in the scriptures where Jesus gets away by himself, uh, isolates himself away to pray. Uh, he pulls his disciples away also for a little bit of time of respite to get away from the mi active ministry that they were doing. Uh, ministry can be draining. If you have ministered to someone or multiple people, you know it can be very tiring. Uh, it, it can be exhausting. So Jesus at this time got the news that John the Baptist had died. They had been ministering to all these people. He tries to pull away uh, up in the mountains a little bit to spend time with his disciples, uh, but he really can't do it. The crowd continues to follow. And it'll be interesting. He, does, he is able to get rid of them eventually, but it's when he stops doing the signs and he teaches and preaches. And uh, one of the best ways to get rid of a crowd is to preach clearly, <laughs> is to teach clearly. And that's what Jesus does exactly. He, uh, he teaches very clearly, and we'll get to that probably next week. Uh, the thousands that are there, then the droves are just, just, just coming to him nonstop from all over. He stops, he teaches clearly. And virtually 100% of them leave, all right? So Jesus uh, does not get rid of them at this point, but it is coming up soon where his teaching will get clearer and clearer and clearer until they have to see him for who he is or reject him, and they choose to reject. Now, uh, verse 4, now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. Now, as we've covered, uh, we've talked much about the feast as we've gone through the book of John the feasts were critical. They were by the law of God. The Jews had to celebrate these feasts. They were extremely important to the culture of the Jews. Three of them were required feasts by the law of God that no matter where you went off to as an Israelite, you had to come back to the temple for these feasts. The feast of feasts, as John mentions here, is the Passover feast. And this is extremely important. This is the great Passover feast. We talk about it a lot here, more than the other feasts, because this is the one where on the night of his betrayal, right, where Jesus transforms it and actually says, I am the reason that God's wrath is going to pass over you. Take of me, take of my body, take of my flesh, take of my blood, because in it is the forgiveness of sins. And he fulfills John the Baptist's prophecy of him, you might say, and announcement, the Lamb of God, who comes to take away the sins of the world. So the Passover is a beautiful tie-in to where our sin goes. It was put upon the Lamb of God. He took it for us so that we can be righteous before the eyes of God, so that we have eternal life. We have assurance of salvation. Our sins have been atoned for. We've been justified. 
We've been sanctified. We have been propitiated for, and we have made right in the eyes of God. Beautiful, all right? So this Passover, though, is at hand, and uh, this can also explain some of the tremendous crowd that is following Jesus at this time. All the pilgrims come in. They have all come in from all over that part of the world back to Jerusalem. Lots more people there than before, and they are aware of Jesus. Why are they aware of him? Well, if you remember, uh, the last Passover, turn to John chapter 2. John chapter 2, verse 23 through 25, John recorded for us what happened. And some, you know, it, it is, and by the way, it is good just to read straight through a gospel, and I encourage you to do that even as we're taking our time going through the gospel verse by verse. Sometimes it goes so slowly and we're staring at individual trees that you don't see the whole forest. So sometimes it's good to read through the book of John multiple times as we're going through the book of John slowly so you can recall these things. But it wasn't too long ago, if you're reading through the book of John, John chapter 2, where uh, this previous Passover was recorded by John. So look at verse 23. So now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name, when they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about him, for he himself knew what was in man. Now, these were the people who one year prior were seeing Jesus. Verse 23, they saw the signs that he was doing. And this is also the time where he cleared the temple out as well. So people were very aware of who he was. They had seen him doing these signs. But also, John hinted here in John chapter 2, the same thing he's hinting at over here in John chapter 6, why did they believe in his name? And John, as we covered, uses the word believe a little unlike we do. Uh, If I say, do you believe in Jesus? I am implying, are you saved? Have you believed in Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, who is, the, who is God, who is man, who lived, who died, who rose, who ascended into heaven, who died for sins? Is that your Savior? Now, John doesn't necessarily mean all of that. He means that they are believing, and under this umbrella of belief, sometimes it's a superficial belief, and sometimes it's real belief. So the context lets us know, is it real Or is this superficial, tangential, not true belief? So John chapter 2, he gives us a hint about those people, right? Why did they believe in him? They believed in him because they saw the signs. But then verse 24, Jesus did not entrust himself to them because he knew their hearts. This was not full, ultimate, repenting, believing in for salvation belief. This was because they saw the signs. It is this same attitude, same heart, of the people now, that those were the pilgrims that had come to the Passover, that were at the temple, that had come from all over. Now they're back. And they're like, wait, where is the guy last year who was performing those awesome signs, right? And so word has now spread, and now thousands are following Jesus at the time of the Passover. Why? For the same reason that John records in 2.23, they want to see more signs. I mean, what is more entertaining than that? There's no TV. There are no smartphones around, right? There is nothing going on. And yet there's a man out there who's making blind eyes, lame to walk, deaf to hear, demons. Like this is unheard of, nothing. And so you see droves of people, pilgrims most likely, following Jesus, okay? Look at verse 5. John chapter 6. Lifting up his eyes then, and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so these people may eat? All right, and just to kind of gather our our minds around in this setting, kind of develop that story in our minds uh, and kind of use our imagination, uh, we have to realize that, that they are way out. They have now become come to a very desolate area. There are no markets, there's no Costco, there's no Sam's, there's no Walmart around, there are no great restaurants to feed this magnitude of people. Um, The people had foregone planning and preparing, apparently the being mesmerized and marveling at the signs had got them so distracted 
They just wanted to see more, 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 more. And next thing you know, Jesus is a long ways out, away from everything, where they cannot get food. Uh, this is not by accident. As you guys know, my word is purpose dent, and Jesus is doing everything on purpose dent. All right? He is doing it on purpose. He has not accidentally found himself way far out in a desolate area, away from all restaurants and stores. It is on purpose, okay? He is setting this miracle up ahead of time, and it's going exactly as planned. So they're out. There are thousands of them. There is no place to get food. And what are they going to do? I'm not going to cover all the synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but look over it. Just hold your place there and look at Mark 6, 34 through 36. He gives us a few details here that John does not cover. And again, you could look into each one of the Gospels to see their take on this because they'll add a few little details that others may not. But I'm just going to use Mark just briefly today. Mark 6, verse 34 through 36 We'll see what Mark records here about this scene. He says, When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, of course, speaking of Jesus, and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Just to pause for a moment, this is beautiful the way Mark has written this. Ultimately, God is the shepherd, right? And so he has compassion on the sheep. They're wandering around, there's thousands of them there. Let's continue on. And he began to teach them many things. And when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the hour is now late. Send them away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. All right, so several things we can take from Mark's account there. He is definitely drawing in this illusion, right, of, of the ultimate shepherd that is Jesus Christ. John will bring that up more, especially in John chapter 10. That he is the ultimate shepherd. As the Old Testament portrayed God as the shepherd and Israel as the sheep, now in the New Testament, Jesus is that shepherd. He's portraying this even now. He shows that he reveals to the heart of Jesus in Mark 6, 34, that he is compassionate and is wanting to help them. Uh, we also take from Mark's account uh, that this is obviously a desolate place and the hour is now late. All right, they're far away. Also from this account, we see that he is teaching them. Uh, John reserves his teaching emphasis for after the supernatural sign and what follows. Mark mentions that there's teaching going on now as well. Uh, and this is, this, is, this is who Jesus is. Jesus is not performing signs just for signs' sake. He is performing the signs so that they can hear him, listen to him, and receive this teaching look at verse 6 let's go back to John chapter 6 John chapter 6 verse 6 <clears throat> John chapter 6 verse 6 as you find your place there pause just for a moment to welcome Rachel and Davis in that just got married last evening uh, congratulations. Give them a hand. You thought you were going to slip in, but I'm not going to let you. <laughs> they had a beautiful, beautiful wedding yesterday. A lot of family in town from, from both sides and just, just a great time. So we celebrate that with them today. All right, look at, uh, look at verse 6, John chapter 6, verse 6 and 7. He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread would not be enough for each of them to get a little. All right, so here in verse 6, the miracle is beginning, we're beginning to see the grasp of this. All right, he says 200 denarii, which if you have a, some kind of a, 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 a reference Bible, study Bible, perhaps it'll say something like this at the bottom, that 200 denarii would be around 8 to 9 months of a wages of an average worker. All right, so it would take a lot of money. Uh, even this would not be enough, though, he said, except for each person to get a little. In other words, just get them a little enough to survive, maybe to get back to where they came from, but it would be just enough to just get a bite, a morsel, okay? Uh, Philip states here the obvious, that there's not enough money to feed this amount of people, plus they're in a desolate area. Even if they had this kind of money, 
Where would they go to buy enough food to feed this amount of people? Uh, we also see in this passage, in verse 6, that Jesus said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. All right, Jesus is sovereign. Jesus is, is omniscient, knowing all things. So he asked this question to Philip. Is Jesus needing to hear this come from Philip in order to know? And no. But he's not doing this so that he will know, but he's doing this so that Philip will know himself, really. It's what this comes down to. Philip's view of Jesus is still not large enough. He has seen him uh, turn water into wine. He has seen him perform many miracles and signs, healing of the lame man, the blind, the, 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 the deaf, and, and, and demons being cast out, etc., etc. Uh, he has seen all these things, but yet his picture, his view of Jesus is still not big enough. So here, we're going to see the biggest, the largest miracle that Jesus is recorded as performing that more people see than any other people will see. Look in verse 8. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? Jesus said, Have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down, about 5,000 in number. All right, so they're brainstorming. The disciples have come to Jesus. Uh, 200 denarii would not be enough for these people just to get a little, right? Then you have Andrew, Simon's brother. And there's, there's not a lot more information here uh, given, but we seem to think that this is probably kind of a... Uh, tongue-in-cheek, sarcasm kind of a thing, like, like they're just looking around, there's no place, they're desolate, they're far away, and there's a boy who has a little bag for his snack that his mom has packed him, five barley loaves. Uh, the quickest, easiest thing you compare the size of that to would be like a Twinkie, all right? Everyone remember Twinkies, all right? That would be about the size of it. If you don't know what they are, it's probably a good thing, all right, but they... As a little bitty, bitty loaf, kind of the size of a Twinkie, as what their historians would say, probably is the average size of this little loaf, okay? So don't think of loaf of bread. So you have five barley loaves and two fish that Andrew says, here is all we have. And, uh, I mean, this is nothing. What can we do to, what, to feed this number of people? Um, and then they have this huge crowd. Now, here the number is listed in verse 10. So the men sat down. About 5,000 in number. Now, John says 5,000 men. Um, uh, 5,000 in number sat down. The Mark 6, 44 says, And those who ate the loaves were 5,000 men. But also, uh, we have here that the numbering most likely is not only men. The odds of there being only 5,000 men there, they think, is zero. Like this is the, the way that historically they would count at the time, 5,000 men, but also attached to those men, there would be their, their, some wives there, there would be some older children there as well, perhaps whole families had come out to be marveled by these signs as well. So historians and theologians say probably somewhere between 15,000 and 20,000 people were actually in this great migration of people to come see the signs that Jesus was performing. So a huge crowd. All right, look at verse 11. Jesus then took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish, as much as they wanted. And when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. All right, so here we have a, the, the, the miracle is taking place. And again, we don't know the exact details. We don't know how because it is supernatural. It's like when Jesus tells a man who has not walked in 38 years to get up, pick up your mat and walk, and he instantly does it. How did that happen? Ligaments and tendons and sinews and muscles and all reattaching and formulating, just boom, instantly he's walking, right? So here we have this great supernatural miracle that is happening and it is, it is huge, it is tremendous. They have all come to see a sign, which Jesus was usually performing on one single person at a time, but they've never seen anything like this that he has done so far. So from five pieces of little barley bread, 
the size of a Twinkie, and two fish. And some of you are thinking like, okay, catfish, are we talking big bass? And no, we're not. Most likely like the luncheon stock type of lunch that would be packed for a boy would be more like a dried sardine, okay? Something that could, could be transported all day in the heat and not rot and smell nasty and ferment and be all gross. So it's a dried out little sardine, okay? So you have five little loaves, you have two little fish, but now all of a sudden it's multiplied. Now, and, and put on your thinking hats for, for just for a moment. I'm not good at math, but I did this ahead of time for us, okay? So if, uh, if there were 20,000 people there, for instance, uh, this would equal now that there would be 100,000 barley loaves, uh, whatever this looked like, or that quantity, it would require 100,000 barley loaves, and it would require 40,000 fish. This is a big increase. And then we have to consider that the meal prepared for the young man was most likely for a boy and was not filling for an adult. But we look back at the passage and it says, everyone ate until they were full. So grown men eating would probably not just eat two little sardines, okay? They ate and they ate until they were all full. And then the disciples come and pick up 12 baskets of leftovers. So now you're talking about numbers that would be more like 120,000 barley loaves and 60,000 fish that were produced from five loaves and two little fish. So all the people have sat down, all the people are seeing this, the great multiplication of food, and they're amazed, right? So what is the response of the people who have come to see more signs? They have just witnessed a great, incredible sign. Uh, they believed, but kind of, sort of, maybe-ish, you know? It's not full, salvific, repenting of sin. You are definitely God in the flesh. Forgive us of our sins, for I have sinned against you. It is a belief, but it is definitely not salvific belief. Uh, let's continue. Look at verse 14. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, This is indeed the prophet who has come into the world. Now, this is good. All right, this is, this, is, this is something, all right, it is a true statement, and it's at least, at least reminiscent, of, a reminiscent of, of Nicodemus in chapter 3, where Nicodemus at least came to Jesus and said, I am aware that you cannot do these things unless God was with you. So he understood the signs as a sign from God. We, no one else is walking around doing this. It has to be from God. You must be from God. You're at least a prophet, all right? Now, the Pharisees in chapter 4, or 5, if we recall, took the opposite view. They actually said that Jesus is not a prophet, that he is not a prophet, even though Jesus says, look, you say you believe in Moses. If you believed in Moses, you would believe in me because he prophesied about my coming. But they rejected that Jesus was even a prophet. So you get Nicodemus, who at least says that Jesus has been sent by God, he is with God, but his belief was not salvific yet at that point either. Uh, you get these people who say that he is the prophet who has come into the world. So this is, this is something good, all right? Uh, but as we, we continue going, we'll find out that it's not full, true, uh, salvific belief. Now, this, this, the way they quote this in verse 14, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. We looked at this last week. We'll look at it again this week too. But go back to Deuteronomy 18, verses 15 through 19. Deuteronomy 18, verses 15 through 19. And in this passage, Moses is told by God that there is going to be the prophet, all right, that is going to come, a greater prophet, the ultimate prophet that is to come. And that they are to listen to him, and if they do not listen to him, they will die. And that there is this great prophet that is coming that is even greater than Moses. And you'll see as you go through the book of John, there's lots of tie-ins back to Moses. And this is one of them too. So the people are saying this is the prophet who is to come into the world. This is distinguishing him from all the other prophets that this is going back to Moses' announcement of the prophet who is going to come into the world. And this is where that prophecy comes from. Deuteronomy 18, 15 through 19. 
The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen, just as you desired of the Lord your God at Oreb uh, on the day of the assembly, when you said, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, or see his great fire any more, lest I die. And the Lord said to me, They are right in what they have spoken. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And whoever will not listen to my words, that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. All right, so this is the prophecy that Moses received from God, that God had announced to Israel, and Israel had held on to. They were expecting the prophet to come in the future that would have the words of God in his mouth. And so they acknowledge that as Jesus feeds all of them, that this must be the prophet who Moses had spoken of. Now, uh, notice also in this passage, what are they supposed to do? When this prophet comes, they are to listen to him. In other words, they are to hear his words, because he has the voice of God, and they are to obey him. And we're going to see that this is not the case. Uh, look over at John chapter 1 again with me. John chapter 1. John chapter 1. Just to see these, these, these historical tie-ins and the Old Testament tie-in. Uh, John chapter 1. It's interesting here. You see the same type of wording used where the Pharisees were also looking for the prophet. The people are acknowledging the thousands that day upon this feeding, that he is the prophet. But look, look over here in John, uh, John chapter 1. They go to John the Baptist and ask him this question. And this is the testimony of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, No. All right, now, I'm not, not, not going into great detail about that, but just letting you know that this is what they were looking for. They understood that prophecy. They knew the prophet was to come. They're seeing John show up on the scene dressed in the clothing of Elijah, right? Teaching hell, fire, and brimstone and repent of your sins, believe in the one to come, baptizing people as well. Uh, surely, John the Baptist is either the Messiah or is either the prophet. But instead, he was the one that was going to announce the coming Messiah, who ended up announcing the prophet, all right? So there are, the people are looking, they're aware of this prophecy. The thousands that day acknowledge that Jesus must be the prophet. The Pharisees in the previous chapter reject Jesus as a prophet, even though he has just performed this sign. Now also, as, as you think on this, and, and their understanding of who Jesus was, in the Old Testament, there was supernatural provision of food uh, was something that God did through three other key prophets in the Old Testament. So you see, the provision of food is also a key trigger in the mind of the Jews who knew the scripture that this must be a prophet from God, the prophet from God. If you think about who else provided supernatural food, obviously Moses comes to mind. God, of course, through Moses, and that's going to be expounded upon because the people know this, and they're going to call Jesus out on this, that he provided food for one meal, but Moses provided food for years. Hint, hint, we want lots more food, Jesus. We'll get to that coming up. But So they, they try to say, look, Moses did all this. You did this. That was great, but we want more. Uh, but also you have Elijah and Elisha, who provided supernatural food as well. Uh, so, but either way, those are the, the three prophets that have also done such a thing that would come to mind in the, in the mind of the people. Now, uh, look at verse 15. Not only do they call Jesus the prophet, uh, but look what else they call him. Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. Now, what's wrong with wanting to make Jesus king? It sounds like a very noble thing to do, right? Uh, to make Jesus king. 
uh, isn't he the king? I mean, he is the Davidic king who was announced, who has come. Uh, he is definitely, uh, Daniel chapter 7, verse 14, we covered earlier when Jesus says, I am the son of man, that he, he is the one who has all authority in heaven has been granted to him. He, he is the ultimate king. But Jesus knew their heart. He knew their motivation for making him king. And it was not holy. It was not to glorify God. But it was selfish. If they did not want him to be king as Jesus meant to be king. They wanted him to be king as they wanted him to be king. And you have to think about this time. It is the Passover time. Uh, this is the time where Jesus, God set them free from being enslaved by the Egyptians. This was the great announcement, right? Uh, this time of year, it was required for them to take up the Passover meal. It was also required of them during that meal to go over and teach the next generation of what God did and how the lamb was sacrificed, how the blood was put on the door, how God rescued them. And the wrath of God did not go into their homes because the blood was there. It was a very edifying, it was a time of teaching, it was a time of this, this meal, but it was a celebrate the great exodus. I mean, that's what the book of Exodus is about. It's exiting. They were exiting out of Egypt. And they were in bondage, they were in slavery. God supernaturally set them free, redeemed them, and they were to celebrate that. This is that time of year. It was like, and there's really nothing you can compare this to, but it would be similarish to uh, Fourth of July, except more educational and less fireworks. All right, and it would be a time of sitting down and talking about how we became free and God setting us free, etc. All right. Now this was this was the time. So you have Jesus who is showing up, is doing these things, and the people say, "This is it. We are now under Roman uh, occupation. The, the Romans are in charge." We want to make Jesus king, go back into Jerusalem. Some say that's also why he mentions how many men were there, that it was not just children, it was not just ladies who are following him, because in that time, you could take over the world with 5,000 men. I mean, this was a lot of people. So they want to make him king. 5,000 men want to make him king, march into Jerusalem, kick out the Romans. They, even if the Romans surrounded the place like they later do in 67 to 70 A.D., and then cut off all food supply, you got Jesus, right? You got food for days. You give him two fish, he'll feed 120,000 people or whatever, 200,000 people, it doesn't matter. They give him a few little Twinkies of bread and feed the everyone. I mean, this, he can feed us, he can heal us, he can raise, raise the dead, we'll find. Like, this is, make him king. He has all this power, all this authority, can do all these things. We want him to be king. So how does Jesus take it? What was his response to their desire to make him king? He withdrew from the crowd. The purpose of Jesus and the purpose of the people for Jesus were in opposition. And this takes us back to the last Passover, John chapter 2. He did not entrust himself to the people because he knew all people. Even though they said, you are the prophet. Even though they said, we want you to be king. They wanted to define the terms. What were they supposed to do if they truly acknowledged that Jesus was the prophet that Moses had prophesied about? Listen. <laughs> they were to listen. They were to obey his teaching. And that's what we're going to find out. Does not happen. Uh, Jesus had come for a greater purpose than to provide free food, health care, and a political powerhouse. We had to, he had come to atone for sins, to suffer, to die, and to provide eternal salvation. The people were far more interested in Jesus meeting their physical, temporal, political needs than they were from being saved from sin or having eternal life. Uh, this lets us know that there are many false converts. There are many false converts today. There are many false converts now. And false converts look a lot different. A lot of times we think false converts all look the same, all believe the same things wrong. But it's not true. Just the chapter before, you have the Pharisees who rejected Jesus as not only not the prophet, but not even a prophet of God. False. All right? False converts. But yet they claim to be disciples of Moses. They claim to be in the chair of Moses, representing God, doing these things for his glory. 
but yet Jesus exposes them as false converts. Here, you have all these thousands of people who call Jesus the prophet, who want to make him king, but yet they as well are false converts. They're not true believers in that sense. All right? Now, this is important. Even though they have some information right about Jesus, they are not true believers. This is for us to apply to ourselves and to others as well. Uh, this is true today. Just because you have some or even all the facts about Jesus correct, it does not necessarily mean that you are saved. There is the gospel information that must be believed for salvation. That is true. But just because you know the facts that who Jesus is, it does not mean that you are saved. Have you believed in him? Have you trusted in Jesus Christ as your Savior, right? So we see here the people are putting some pieces together, but yet they're wanting to define them how they want them defined. Uh, as we'll see, uh, close to 100% of the people, think about this, whether it was 5,000 or as most think is fifteen to 20,000 people, almost 100% of those who ate the supernatural miraculous meal who ate to, till their fill, will leave and abandon Jesus in the next passages that we cover. Uh, they leave him. They reject him. They will not listen to him. The moment his teaching, his preaching, reaches this climactical point of, this is who I truly am. You can take me as I am or leave. They choose to leave. From calling him prophet, from calling him king, to rejecting him and going away. In summary, about a year from this time that we're covering today, Jesus will go to Jerusalem, not on the shoulders of 5,000 men trying to make him king, but on the back of a small donkey. He will also be announced as king of the Jews, but it will be done in an effort to humiliate him as he is hung on the cross with a sign over his head as he dies, the king of the Jews. God the Son became incarnate, to accomplish and perform many signs to prove that he was sent from God and that the people were to listen to him. But they wanted a prophet, they wanted the Messiah, they wanted a king, they wanted to define the terms and not let him define the terms for them. What they wanted was temporary, not eternal. Jesus will soon teach them that he has not come to provide a nonstop supply of food, but that he himself is the food for eternal life. And that's what we'll find in the scriptures to come. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for sending the bread of life, the ultimate manna from heaven, the prophet, the king, Jesus Christ, for our salvation. God, we pray that there, if there is someone today who has some information about Jesus correct, uh, but is not saved, Lord, we pray that you would draw them to yourself for salvation today. May they see their sin. May they see your holiness. May they see that they need to be made right before you. And the only one that can do that is the Savior, the Lamb of God that you have sent, who lived, who died, who rose from the dead to take our sins and pay the price for us. Lord, we thank you that the Passover Lamb has come and that we celebrate Jesus as taking our sins away and atoning for our sins. Uh, we thank you, God, for the scripture that we have today, for the signs that John has recorded, so that we may know uh, not, and not have doubts and not want just wonder, but that we may know that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, we may have eternal life. Lord, help us not to seek Jesus for only temporal things. Help us not to seek Jesus as the Jews did for for temporary things like food or like physical health or even political prowess, but help us to seek Jesus for eternal life. We thank you for the grace and the mercy that you have given us.